first to thank the organizers for inviting me here. Uh, and I would also like to take uh, <coughs> this opportunity to thank today's chair, at least for this session, Israel Weinsenker, who was the first person who invited me to Brazil. And that's many years ago. And uh, <coughs> it was in Recife. But I also visited IMPA when it was at uh, downtown when it, before it moved here. Um, the, incidentally, the paper that Francesco uh, quoted yesterday, <coughs> an old paper on mine on twisted cubics, was started while I was visiting Israel in Recife. So it all sort of ties nicely together. Today I will talk about not smooth curves, but singular curves. So <clears throat> the title I gave was Counting Curves on Singular Surfaces. But in fact, the curves that I'm counting should also be singular. So I'm not interested in the situation of smooth curves, but of singular curves. <coughs> and I have to say also that um, what I'm going to, uh, <coughs> uh, is going to be the content of the lecture is more like a report on an abandoned project with Florian Bloch. And a possible project for a PhD student. So it was a student, Nödland, who just finished his master degree in Oslo, and I'm trying to sell him this project. Florian abandoned it. I'll come back to that, why he did later. <coughs> so let me first give some background. And I have to be brief, and I have to not mention a million names that should have been mentioned. So you have to go to the literature, and you check everybody who's worked on <coughs> curves on smooth sur surfaces. And this is, of course, a story that goes back <coughs> to 19th century, uh, especially in the case of plane curves. So. Uh, In the case of plane curves, we're looking at curves in a linear system. So look at curves, plane curves of degree d. And inside here, you can look at, <coughs> for example, what you would call R nodal curves. They would have R nodes. So node is an ordinary double point. And this is, if you take the closure here, this is commonly known as the severity variety. And the <coughs> problem of interest is to find the degree of the severity variety. And uh, and this degree you can show is the same as counting the number of C in O, P, D, sorry, O, P, 2, D with R nodes and going through the appropriate number of points, which in this case would be the dimension of the linear system. Over two, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Does it work? Minus one, and then minus r. So you can express the sublinear system by the condition of going through various points. Um, so the <coughs> whole thing here is that n r is a polynomial. in D of degree to R, which is not the important thing here. It's sort of the polynomiality, which is important. So this is an example of a node polynomial. If you want a, the simple example is, of course, N1, which is the number of degree D curves in a general pencil 
which have singular fibers. And this you can compute, for example, by the discriminant. So this, <coughs> what you get is 3d minus 1 square. And actually, from my point of view and in this talk, this is not the way to write it. It looks very nice. It has 3 as a factor. That's by accident. It's <coughs> 0 for d equals 1. That's not an accident. If you have a pencil of lines, you have no singular fibers. But actually, you should think of this as 3d squared minus 3, sorry, minus 2 times 3d plus 3. And this 3 <coughs> and this 3, well, this, these two, three d, two 3s actually have something in common. This is actually a joint mass and has nothing to do with this 3. But we'll come back to that. <coughs> so <coughs> this would sort of be the... <coughs> very classical situation. But of course, one could also ask for different kinds of singularity. So instead of asking how many curves with this many nodes, how many curves with one triple point, one node, three cusps, five quadruple points, etc., And then you <laughs> make the same kind of thing. And um, you could ask for <coughs> any given set of singularities. I will briefly come back to that, but this is not going to be a, uh, a big point either. But now, there is, of course, no reason to stick to the plane case. We may as well look at an arbitrary surface. So x is now a smooth projective surface, and you can ask the same questions. And <coughs> well, now you have a degree, but you have a degree of the surface. So you have to say, <coughs> you also have to give a linear system. You want to look at curves in this linear system with given type of singularities passing through the appropriate number of points. And uh, for this to make sense and for <coughs> us to expect to get uh, a formula which is valid, we need L to be ample enough so that we have enough curves to work with. And I will not, <coughs> there are thresholds for the size and all that which I will not uh, go into at this point. But what we get in this case we will also get node polynomials. But the, polyno the <coughs> expressions will now be polynomials in four turn characters. So nr, and for that matter, all these guys also, if I take arbitrary singularities, nr <coughs> will be polynomial in four characters, l square, lk, k square, this is kx, canonical line bundle. And then I have c2 or c2 of x, which is the second short class. So now I'm on a smooth surface. And um, for example, to explain this way of writing it, you show that n1 is 3 times l squared minus 2 times, <coughs> sorry, plus 2 times lkx plus there is no k square in the formula for n1. But if you go to n2, k square is going to appear, and so on. So you're going to have everything. And this, for those who know, this is the second churn class of the first bundle of principal parts, which you can read about in the EGA. It's the jet bundle. <coughs> now, let me just briefly mention two other approaches. Instead of just fixing one surface, you can also look at curves in families of surfaces. And it turns out that this is useful because questions arise in real life, like uh, was proved by Israel.
for example, if you have a threefold and you intersect <coughs> with hyperplanes, then you get a family of surfaces and you want to count things on that. And it's also something which uh, <coughs> comes up in the work uh, I'm doing with Steve Kleiman because our process of computing node polynomials involve actually, even if we pass, start with one surface, we're going to pass two families of surfaces because we're blowing up different points uh, on the surface and it makes a family. Now, of course, the <coughs> uh, very central and interesting part is to, since I have for each R, I have a polynomial, so then you can make a generating function. So you take NR or NR with something and then you introduce a variable t to the power r and you sum. So you get the formal power series in these classes and the structure <coughs> here is very, very interesting. And to just throw out a few names, uh, Di Francesco Itzigsen and for the case of plane curves, Konsevic also plane curves, Yao Satchlow, K3 surfaces. Then of course, he's not asleep, <laughs> the famous Gutscher conjecture. So I will at least mention names of people who are present. And um, which was later proved by Tseng and also by Richard Thomas and his collaborators. And there has been a lot of work by Lothar and by others uh, in refining his conjecture so that it also applies to real curves and will change invariants and so on. So this is a whole other story which I will not touch upon today. Okay, so now <coughs> this is all well as long as the surface you work on is smooth. So now what if the surface has singularities? So let's consider now a surface what do I want to say? X is now a normal projective surface. So it means it has isolated singularities only. And of course, this is the first step if you want to do it for general singular surfaces, but it's not obvious that non-normal surfaces are so interesting to study in this context, as far as I can tell. I think, I think the main sort of <coughs> way to go, and this has to do also with the main class of examples that we will be looking at, <coughs> are the ones where the singularities are isolated. So uh, that means I now have X in Pn. It has some degree. And <coughs> I consider, for simplicity now, the line bundle of hyperplane sections. Okay, and I want I want to see <coughs> what are in this linear system. What are the singular curves? So n1 is number of singular hyperplane sections in a pencil of hyperplane sections. So I take a one-dimensional family of hyperplane sections, a left set pencil, and then I count how many are singular. That's N1. But N1, if you think about it, well, you may not <laughs> want to know, but this is also the degree of what is called the second polar variety. of x, and it's also the degree of the dual variety. Dual varieties were mentioned briefly by uh, Francesco, but this is uh, uh, not dual of curves. Where is um, here? <coughs> uh, 
So these are different ways. So this is how, how do you find the degree of the dual variety? You take a pencil of hyperplanes and you count how many of them are uh, tangent, contain the tangent space at the point of x. So that's how you get it. You have to be a little careful when you have singularities, and that's why you get different formulas, of course, in the singular case. So let me give you an example. I'm sorry for all the ends. This is now the dimension of the space. So I have a, maybe I'll just do it like this. X is now in P3. And it has isolated singularities. <coughs> so then N1, <coughs> and this I should say is originally due to Tessier, maybe also Lomont. Uh, first, who did, who showed that this is equal to m times m minus 1 square minus, and now there is a correction term due to the isolated singularities, and <coughs> those are not topological invariants of the singularity but topological invariant of the singularity and of a hyperplane section of the singularity. So it's the sum of the Milner numbers. So this is, <coughs> I mean, either, either you know this or you don't really want to know, but this, this is the ordinary Milner number, and this is the Milner number of a hyperplane section of your surface at the singular point. So, uh, <coughs> if you write this as, uh, and I'm going to do three, uh, this, write this out. I'm sorry for doing too much of uh, explicit computations here. Minus 4m plus 6, and then minus this sum. Um, And if you, if you <coughs> look at what is here, this term is C2 of a non-singular surface in P3 <coughs> of degree M. So what you're actually, and this you see is something else. This is like these guys first two terms are like this, and then you have this which only depends on the surface, not on the linear system. And here you see that if you replace, if you replace O of 1 by O of D, then this is going to give you D square and D in here. But this, of course, will remain unchanged because it doesn't depend on the linear system. And so, my point is that if you want a formula in something in the singular case, you have to correct what we see here is how we have to correct the second churn class in order to get the valid formula. So we correct with these Milner numbers at the singular points. So now, <coughs> If we go to higher number of nodes, then, as I said, for nr when r is at least 2, so this is in general, kx squared appears in the formula. And now, the question, when you have only isolated singularity, you have a normal surface, you have a canonical divisor. Uh, it needs not be uh, Cartier, but if you have a nice situation, it could be at least uh, Q Cartier, and <coughs> you could have intersection theory, but this intersection number might not be an integer. It could be a rational number. And that's not so convenient <laughs> when you want to plug it into a formula counting things. I mean, sometimes miracles work, and something which is not an integer come with the right coefficient and becomes an integer, but this is sort of too much to really hope for. So <coughs> that's a big question. So 
Let me now go back to the situation here. This is sort of a modified churn class. And so what are churn classes for singular varieties? And I have to be brief. And um, I only want to mention two, which to, for me is the two most important sort of extensions of the notion of churn classes to singular varieties. And those are the Mather churn classes and the Schwarz McPherson churn classes. <coughs> so the Mather is simply the pushdown of the churn classes of the Nash bundle, actually the Nash bundle I'm doing. <coughs> so where nu from x to x is the Nash transform, sometimes the blowing up, actually most times the blowing up, but not always the blowing up of, his, of the singular locus. The Nash transform and we have up on x tilde, we have a surjection <coughs> to a bundle. So this is the Nash bundle. And what is, <coughs> how is <coughs> this type of churn class made? It's made to be a projective character in the sense that if I have, maybe I'll just say it instead of writing it. So if I have a projective variety, I take a linear projection of it to a smaller projective space, then the mather churn classes downstairs are just the pushdowns of the mather churn classes upstairs. So they behave nicely. With respect to linear projection. So in projective geometry, they're nice to work with. And also I should say that in the theory of polar classes, <coughs> these are the ones that replace the ordinary churn classes in the relation between polar classes and churn classes. So you can, in the non-singular case, you can actually define churn classes using the polar classes. This is what Todd Eger did. Uh, and you can vice versa compute um, Polar variety, polar classes in terms of churn classes. And in this correspondence, this is the right object. So now, the other, which was the more difficult thing to define, where the <coughs> Schwartz, they were defined independently by Marie Hélène Schwartz and uh, McPherson with very different methods. But they're now usually re referred to as. Schwartz, McPherson, and <coughs> let me call them C, S, M, P, I, X, and I will not define them because it's, it involves constructible functions, the definition of the local Euler obstruction, etc. But they are defined, and what is good with them? is that they are topological invariants. That's how they were constructed. So if you have a homeomorphism from one variety to another, then the <coughs> Schwarz-McPherson class downstairs is just the push down of the Schwarz-McPherson upstairs. So they are different in nature and um, in, ca in the case we are in, <coughs> in the case of a, so not the example, but in the case of a surface with isolated singularities, the first churn classes are essentially all the same. So that's not where, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, but uh, it's not natural and it's, uh, well, then you work on that, but that's not where you want to work. Yeah, you, sometimes you do that, but then you can compare and you can find them. Yeah, but uh, now I want to do it without resolution, okay? And it's not, 
I mean, this would be another way of uh, uh, looking at things. Okay, so um, as I said, since <coughs> the mother churn classes are the one that behave according to polar varieties, this is actually, in this example, this thing corrected by the sum of the two Milner numbers will be the mother second churn class of the surface. Whereas, what about the topological thing? Well, you know, <coughs> for the topological thing, you have the vanishing cycles, which is precisely the Milner number. And so, the, <coughs> the, in that case of a hypersurface, the schwartz mcpherson churn class would be this thing corrected by just the ordinary Milner numbers of the singularity. So that's the difference between the Mather and the schwartz mcpherson classes. It's really this, the sum of these guys here, which are Milner numbers of the curves you get when you intersect the surface through a singular point. Okay. On. Yeah, let me just make some other remark according to Nash. So as you know, Nash just won the Abel Prize for 2015. He will come to Oslo in May to receive it, together with Nirenberg. So I'm happy to uh, use some more Nash uh, terminology. There's also higher Nash transformations. And suppose you want to, suppose you want to do and let me just put it one triple point. So it's the D4, actually I should maybe say N D4. D4 is ordinary triple point. And in, if you're in the smooth case, this is the second churn class of the second bundle of principal parts, so the second jet bundle. Which you can compute, which I'm not going to express. And uh, now if, if you think about the Mather situation, you might want to correct this formula by passing to what's called higher Nash transforms, where you instead of taking so the first infinitesimal neighborhood of the diagonal, you take the second one, and you make a locally free quotient just in the way you do here, and then you get some <coughs> sheaf. So and this I have not tried at all, but I imagine this would be something one could look at. Um, these were studies by uh, Elsa, uh, Anna Oneto, Elsa Satini, long, long time ago, by Yasuda recently, by um, Daniel Duarte, who's now back in Mexico, who was in Toulouse, uh, in the case of Tuareg varieties. So they are not, uh, they have been <coughs> studied also. Okay, so let me now finally, yeah, I have half an hour. So. See how far I get. So now I want to go to the main <coughs> example of that <coughs> I'm interested in of singular surfaces with isolated uh, singular yeah with isolated singular points, and they will be toric surfaces. And they're, of course, uh, uh, combinatorial objects, and, um, but very nice varieties. The advisor in Liverpool of a former master student of mine just told him that, ah, you know, toric varieties, that's just a playground for children. You need to do the real stuff, like the right categories, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so this, this student was not doing toric varieties, but his, uh, he came back and told, my present master student that uh, what his advisor had said and uh, <laughs> you know, you're just doing kid stuff. <laughs> anyway, I think uh, it's 
rhetoric varieties are nice. Let's, let's, look at a few, let's look at a few examples. And I will, uh, they can be defined by fans or by polytopes. Now, for surfaces, I will only look at polygons. So I will not do the fan thing. You have to go back and forth between fans and, uh, <coughs> and polygons. But uh, let's just stick to the polytope version. So here is P2, three points. And you get this, of course, by taking C. I should have said that I'm working over the complex numbers. I don't want to bother with positive characteristic. I don't want to bother about rationality of points and all that. So for all practical purposes, we're over C. And you close up, and then you get P2 is P2. So this is P2. You use the monomials that you get from the coordinates in two variables to give you the map. So you send uh, x, y to 0, 0, x, 0, y, 0. Okay? And then you do the same, for example, with this guy. You get p1 cross p1. You can do something more, uh, maybe I'll put it over here. Here is m plus 1, 0. Here is 1, 0. <coughs> Here is 0, 1. <coughs> and then this is 1, 1. And this is a Hirzebro surface. So all of these uh, sort of surfaces that we know and love are toric. I mean, many of them that we are actually using all the time. Um, we have to be a little bit careful with um, the fact that these representations are, of course, not unique. So when you give one poly polygon and another polygon, they could give precisely the same uh, embedding. So for example, if you look at 2, 3, 1, 2, <coughs> you have a lattice point in here. So you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this is a surface in P6. Now, if you instead looked at 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, <coughs> let's see, so you will have one here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, these two give the same. And they are both what are called the weighted projective planes with weights 1, 2, 3. And from you know algebraic point of view, it doesn't make any difference if you use this one or this. But if you're a combinatorialist and you want to use <coughs> floor diagrams or long edge graphs or tropical geometry or whatever in order to count nodal curves, then you like this one, and you don't like this one. So this is what's called an H-transverse polygon, because all the outward normals to the edges have integer slope. Whereas this one, this is not true if you represent it like this. So to, for the combinatorialists, they cannot use this, but they can use this way of looking at it. So it's, <coughs> I'll get back to it, but it's not. I mean, the, the way you represent your polygon really matters if you want to use special combinatorial methods. And uh, now let's uh, see how much I can do. So these, <coughs> uh, as I said, this, this mixture of combinatorics, floor diagrams, tropical geometry. Uh, this mixture has been used by many people. Um, for example, maybe I'll just mention them. Fumin, Mikalkin, Brigalle, Bloch, Colley, and Kennedy, <coughs> among others, uh, for in the case of projective plane. In the case of P1 cross P1, 
uh, Cooper and Pandari Panda counted using Fox spaces. And if you want to know what Fox spaces are, you have to ask Lothar, who wrote a paper with Block also on Fox spaces and these things. And I have to admit I have not read <laughs> that paper. But this is certainly methods that can be used. Um, so use floor diagrams, tropical geometry, etc., to count nodal curves on what are called the H transverse toric surfaces. Those which can be represented by an H transverse polygon. Uh, and uh, so, so this is what um, Florian was doing with Ardila. And uh, they came some way. But then Liu and Osserman, Brian Osserman, and this is all recent, <coughs> improved their work. And so they gave uh, polynomiality conditions. So this is in their work. They show that so if you have an H transverse polytope, you can sort of, you have the number of edges. You have all these integer slopes of the normals. Uh, all this is going to de define the shape of the surface. But then you can stretch the edges. So you can give like multi-degrees to your line bundle. And that's sort of the multi-degree of the surface. And what they showed here was that uh, these node polynomials are polynomials in the multi-degree and also in the shape of the surface. So this is uh, interesting work. Now, <coughs> they tried to, com I mean, they did some computations in special cases. Um, I have a problem with one of them, but uh, Liu and Osserman went further and got more explicit computations and proposed uh, correction terms. Let me just see. Uh, I should say from that. And so <coughs> what sort of happened uh, in here with Florian, the reason I say we had an abandoned project, was that after this paper, we started to look at the churn classes and, and trying to see whether we could find correction terms for k square and c2 in order to make this formula work by using the results or similar results um, in, in the case of special uh, toric surfaces. But then Liu and Osterman pushed it further. And essentially, they show that you need infinitely many new uh, correction terms. I mean, you cannot just find, you cannot, it's not as easy to just say you correct c2 with something, you correct k square with something. There seems to be more things appearing. And this is not completely uh, strange in some sense, because if you think of uh, at least one process of getting the formulas is that you do it recursively. And somehow you introduce, you could introduce a new Nash bundle in each step, and it will give you a new invariant. So it's, um, I think it's still sort of a, a bit mysterious, but uh, uh, Florian felt that, uh, well, now that they show we cannot really do it as easily as we had hoped. We were too optimistic. Uh, but the real reason the project was abandoned was that he actually decided to quit academia. So he's now doing, as far as I know, finance in New York. So. But then, <clears throat> as I said, I'm trying to sell this to, uh, he just finished his master thesis. And he's a better combinatorialist than I am. So I thought there would be some hope that he would want to do this. Um, so he works with 
<coughs> weighted projective spaces. And I already gave you one weighted projective space. If I have a one in, as one of the weights, then I can always represent the polygon in the sort of normal uh, quadrant here in the, in the plane. If you have, uh, <coughs> in general, so K, M, N are pairwise prime. I mean, you can multiply uh, and, and get, which corresponds to getting larger line bundles, but the sort of basic structure is given by having these rel uh, pairwise relatively prime. And how do you represent <coughs> uh, this uh, object? Well, you make, you make a skew plane, and you put the polygon in the skew plane. So what you do is you look at three points. <coughs> this is going to be the plane kx plus my plus nz is, sorry, not zero, <laughs> kmn. And then you see if you have x, mn, zero, zero, and here you have <coughs> kn, zero, zero, and here you have uh, m, sorry, k, m, zero, zero, oops, zero, zero, Here you want Kn, and here you want Kn. OK, so those are the intersection with the axis. And then inside, so now you're in this plane, in this skew plane, and this defines you uh, two lattice, Z2, in here, and that's where you work. So this is, uh, <coughs> gives a lattice, and then you can sort of take it from the axis. And <coughs> means that the computations you have to make, you have to be a little careful because you're always, I mean, you're, you're not in your sort of usual situation in, in the ordinary plane. Um, let me, this is the green book, Gelfand Kapranov Zelewinski. And in that book, they proved a formula for the dual of a toric variety in terms of volumes of the polytope. So <coughs> if we have a smooth, let me just do the surface case. First, then what they did was to, they said that the degree I'm going to call it M1, because that's what I've been calling the degree of the dual, which is also has an enumerative significance. And this is three times the lattice volume of P minus twice the lattice volume of the edges plus the lattice volume of the vertices, which is just the number of vertices. So this is uh, churn class. This is the second churn class. And uh, this is the edge length is the <coughs> length of the canonical divisor. It's L times K. And here we have the volume of the polygon. And this means that uh, what has vo lattice volume one is a simplex. Okay. So here is one. This thing has volume two, lattice volume two. S Sorry? No, well, no, that is, no, it, this is, this thing here is, okay? <laughs> In this case. Now, this was generalized by Matsui and Takeuchi. 
So x could now be singular toric. And let's just assume isolated singularities. And then you get the same 3 times the volume minus 2 times the volume of edges. And instead of just counting the vertices, you count the vertices with a weight. And the weight is the local Euler obstruction at the point. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to have time to say anything about the local Euler obstruction. <coughs> V, V, a vertex. So I sum over the vertices. And uh, Euler obstruction could be a surface with isolated singularities, has <coughs> Euler obstruction usually negative, uh, but it could be zero. It could, if it is one, it means it's a singular point. It's a non-singular point. And uh, actually, this is uh, an open question whether you can find uh, generalizations to that in higher dimension. And what uh, actually Nerdlund gave an example in three dimensions where you have isolated singularities with Euler obstruction equal to one, contrary to uh, conjecture of these guys. So that's another direction. Uh, let me just finish with uh, what I can say. So now, <coughs> the hope was, of course, that in the case of these objects, I mean, these are objects which essentially depends on three integers. And everything you can say about this object, you should be able to deduce from these three integers. So if you have a formula counting curves on such an object, it should just be a formula <laughs> involving these three integers. Of course, life is not quite as simple because uh, for those of you who know toric surfaces and resolution of singularities, you have all these um, continued fractions and you cannot just write closed formulas. I mean, you have to write things in, uh, and, and you can do algorithms. And in fact, <coughs> what, uh, uh, what he could do, so <coughs> what he showed, was that uh, he gave algorithm sorry to compute and we're still in the n1 case i warn you i mean this is a far cry from getting anywhere in the general case but we have to start somewhere so n1 of let's say p k m n and uh, he also gave closed formulas in special cases. Depending on what uh, these integers are, I see I have to hurry up. Um, for example, well, maybe I should not give it. Uh, if you look at P, M, N, M plus N. You can give a closed formula, for example. If you look at P, 1, 1, M, you can give a closed formula. Now, <coughs> the question is, when can we try to, <coughs> here we're sort of using brute force to compute Euler obstructions, which you can do in the toric case. Uh, from the polygon, uh, whereas in the case here, you have a different sort of attack. And um, I mean, the same numbers essentially are involved, but if you want to uh, guess correction terms or you want to compare, you need to see that you are actually in a situation that these weighted projective planes actually satisfy the H transversal hypothesis because not all of them do. I mean, here you think this is not a trans <coughs> transversal, but this is. So you see even <coughs> if you, I mean, you have to be careful with 
uh, how you start. So, um, yeah, I don't have many minutes. Let me just say that what he, I mean, you have to see which ones can be represented in an H transversal one. So he showed that, again, that the only, Weighted projective spaces, projective planes, he also looked at spaces. These are weighted projective planes coming from H transversals polygons are <coughs> precisely the two I wrote, P, M, N, M plus N, and P, one, one. So it's good in the sense that then we have closed formulas at least for N1, but uh, it's still sort of uh, limited. Uh, I should say that the better formulas from Liu and Osserman are in the case when the polygon is not only H transversal, but what they call strongly H transversal. And that actually means that the surface singularities are Gorenstein, or it implies that the surface singularities are Gornstein, so rational double points. And uh, which of these are strongly H transversal? <coughs> Only one that is strongly H transversal of these are P112, and this is the weighted projective plane, which is the cone over a plane conic. And there is sort of a limited amount of how you can study this cone in order to get all the new invariants you need. But you can multiply by an integer and use a different linear system. Sorry? This is here, this is here, it's included here, yeah. <laughs> so these are, these are really the ones. So special cases, the P1 and minus 1N. It's essentially this situation, yeah. So uh, the problem now, yeah, I have two minutes. The problem is if you try to use these two situations, actually there is another one one can also use, but uh, which is not the weighted projective plane where, but where one can compute things. And you see that when you make C2, uh, correct C2, then in the next formula for N2, you see that with this correction of C2, you get that K square has to be a certain thing. And uh, in this case, so let me finish by saying that. So <coughs> I'll drop the other example because it takes too long time. Here you get, if I can find it, so C2M in this case is you have three vertices. Sorry, <clears throat> so you have one plus one plus the third one, which is singular, and the singular has Euler obstruction two minus n. And so you get four minus n. So this is, <clears throat> you can like to write this as three, which is the churn class, second churn class if the thing had been smooth, and then you correct by m minus one which is zero if M is one, because if M is one, you get P2. And then you try to see what should be the replacement for K square, given that you know the formula for the two nodal uh, curves, and you get 11 minus 2M, which is actually nine minus two 
m minus 1. This looks very promising. It's an integer. I mean, you say, this is, this is k square of the projective plane, and then you correct. C2 of the projective plane, you correct. Problem comes when you want to go to three nodals. So at least with the computations done by Ardila Block and Leo Osserman, there it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. So you need something else. And so <coughs> maybe there is sort of an accident that in this case it works for N2, and then the problem starts at N3. In the case of uh, not the Hirzebrock, but if you sort of add uh, a thing like this, <coughs> you can get a nice uh, H transversal polygon, and you can compute in the case of N1 and N2. And if you use the corrected form of C2 in the N2 formula, it doesn't work. It doesn't make sense at all. So um, the, the field is open, and I think I'll stop there. <laughs>